Brandy Kritika leads Mission Care Collaborative, the largest caregiver community in the country. She's transforming the culture of care with a goal of ensuring continuous improvement. Today, we'll highlight results from a recent study of workforce dynamics, which includes some disturbing findings, such as the prevalence of racial refusal and the challenges facing younger caregivers. Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast a weekly show where I interview top healthcare leaders about their lives and careers. Please leave a comment, subscribe, or provide a rating or review. Brandy, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Hi, thanks there, David. And we're going to talk all about what you've been up to lately, but I want to wind the clock back a little bit, if you don't mind, and just talk about your upbringing and maybe start with any any particular uh, childhood influences that have stuck with you throughout your career. Absolutely. Thanks for having me here today. So uh, I grew up in a poor working class family in a small town in Michigan called Kalamazoo. And I learned a lot about life by watching my father. So my dad was the hardest working guy at a local factory, never missed a day of work, but he could never move much beyond minimum wage. So some of my earliest memories are watching my parents hustle to make ends meet. And I remember promising to myself that I wanted something different. So as I mentioned, I was from small town Kalamazoo, hardworking town, a great town, uh, but a town with more limited career opportunities for someone. So um, I guess I just had a hunger to do more. Now that sounds good. And then what did you do uh, education wise, which is, you know, typically a, a part of moving, moving out of that type of situation? Yeah, so I had to put myself through school, um, pay for my own college, and because I got good grades and had financial need, I got a scholarship to attend a local community college first. So I did that for a couple of years, uh, hustled hard to save, worked to attend a four-year university to get my bachelor's degree. And during that time, while I was going to school, I found a uh, CEO and uh, other leaders at a local architectural firm that's called King Scott that took me under their wing. And I was just this kid in college. I just really wanted to come in and learn everything about business. And so I was thrust into this environment with these really awesome leaders that let the young kid come in and ask questions and attend meetings and go to conferences and learn how the world works and really just be a fly on the wall. So um, that's kind of where I started. And by the time I graduated, I had four years of business experience working in a professional setting. And I walked into my first full-time marketing role with that same firm that took me under their wing. So I stayed there for a couple of years out of college. And then I felt a calling to go bigger and moved to Chicago to find my way to my next opportunity. Okay, great. No, it's really interesting for you to bring that out. I saw your LinkedIn. I saw King Scott and I and I was trying to understand how that all fit in. I think it's so important uh, that kind of first job out of college, and never mind if you actually are able to, you know, make that connection uh, earlier on. It can just be so formative uh, in terms of getting started. Absolutely. So after uh, going, uh, it sounds like uh, Chicago. I, I saw uh, I saw Cantar TNS is one of the one of the things that you did. I don't know if that was in in Chicago, but where where did you go after? Uh, where, where did you go from King Scott? I guess you stuck with the K's along the way. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, there's a big acronym bash here, David. So Cantar yeah. um, was part of WPP, um, which is the world's largest marketing conglomerate. Um, so I worked for a company that was called Research International, which is now TMP. To throw another acronym. In there. So um, essentially, I was in a digital marketing role, um, but working for the world's largest marketing research company. And that's where my appreciation and passion for research and data and the power of how data could tell stories and accelerate change was really born. And I happened to just be in the right place at the right time. So when I joined Research International, the global operations essentially was moving from London to Chicago. And the new global CEO had an office right outside my cube at the time. And so I went in early every day, followed this guy to the bathroom. I followed him to the coffee machine until he noticed me and he gave me a project. And that project was to bring 55 countries and their respective CEOs together through a new online web presence that would essentially help set the stage for 
a future acquisition. So that's what I did there. I worked hard, launched that project. I was really in over my head. So I hired my boyfriend, now husband's company at the time, and we built that together. And that kind of led us on our path to start building and, and growing what we have today. Well, that sounds good. So with this boss that you had and you were following him around all over the place and I guess to the bathroom, I'm, I'm assuming just to the door of the bathroom, but I, I don't know. Did he give you this global project because he thought maybe you'd go to some other country and leave him alone? <laughs> yeah, well, nothing nothing creepy, but I think he was like, well, you know what? She She's hungry and she wants yeah. to work. So um, yeah, again, tying back to childhood experiences, I think I just always had this hustle. Like I was always trying to like trade basketball cards with the neighbors to make a profit or sell tomatoes, or I just wanted to learn and I wanted to work hard. And, um, you know, I think uh, he had an agenda. I mean, they were trying to set the company up for an acquisition and that's no easy feat to wrangle 55 countries with yeah. this new online web presence. And I had a hunger. I didn't quite know what I was doing, but I think he knew I would figure it out. And um, I, I did. And then after that, I was like, gosh, I really like building things. So that's when I started to work for venture capitalists and got my first uh, VC job in Chicago. Excellent. And I saw uh, Kritika Group, which I assume is your uh, agency that was working with the VCs. Is that right? That's right. Yep. So um, I worked internally for uh, three venture capitalists in Chicago at a couple of different um, startups. And then I launched my own small digital marketing company and VCs um, became my clients. And then uh, Nathan, that's my husband and co-founder, we started our first business together, which is My CNA Jobs, which is now part of our broader portfolio at Mission Care Collective. And that's how kind of our, our story, if you will, of, of how we started the business together. Great. Okay. No, it's a lot between, you know, your, your LinkedIn profile is actually fairly expressive, but I'm, I'm learning a lot about all the, uh, all the connections here and the, uh, and the pathway. So that's, I really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, let's talk about Mission Care Collective. Now, um, I want to know about the, the mission of Mission Care. And then what does it mean to be a collective? That's a sort of an unusual name for, you know, not with the, you know, for, the, for this decade. Yeah, yeah. Good question, David. So I want to preface this by saying, like, what we set out to build has become much bigger than I think what we could have ever imagined. Um, our mission today is to bring people together that change the culture of care. And that is a very fancy way of saying we feel called, a strong sense of calling to make care better tomorrow than it is today. And to give you some, some backstory here, when we started our first business, My CNA Jobs, many moons ago, we didn't really know who a caregiver was, who a CNA was, who a home health aide was. But they are essentially the lifeblood of our care delivery system. And now we connect over 3 million people at work to work and training annually all across the nation. And when COVID hit, we were really great at connecting people to work and connecting companies to caregivers. But here's the problem. Those direct care workers were going out the back door faster than they're coming through the front door. There's not enough direct care workers to meet the demands of people that need care. I mean, fundamentally, you have care companies that are in the business of delivering care that can't deliver it because they don't have the workforce. So, you know, you have nursing homes that are at capacity and can't take more patients. And then when you look at the workforce, David, um, really kind of what we, we learned over the last decade is 53% of these individuals are living in poverty. They're on some form of public assistance. They have no insurance. They're three times more likely to struggle with anxiety and depression. They can earn money someplace else. Like these individuals are doing this work because they feel like it's their calling. And so like many businesses, when like COVID hit, we're like, what does this mean for our business? What does it mean for the industry? And openly, we weren't sure. But if our mission was to make care better and we knew there was a retention problem, we couldn't just sit on the sidelines and just help companies make hires that were fleeing faster than they were, were joining. And that's when we expanded and we became Mission Care Collective, which does now include a, a suite of brands, but it, it's more than that. So if you look at the healthcare ecosystem, there's fundamentally too few partners. There's too few collaborations in our space. A lot of uh, individuals are focused on like tackling this problem, but not together. So like mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that's happening in silos. So the word collective is really about bringing partners, communities, 
policy and innovation together to really drive change. So at our core, David, we're a mission-driven company that's working tirelessly to disrupt the care space, not to just say we did it, but because it's it's needed. Great. Well, you you more or less answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, and you've gotten a lot of attention uh, recently about a study that you did on workforce dynamics. And we'll talk in a minute about some of the, the findings from that. But why why did you want to conduct a study uh, in the first place? Why did why did you want to do that? Yeah, um, data and stories are everything. So um, I mentioned I, I once worked at Research International, and that's where I got my love and passion for data and stories. We run a lot of um, research studies here at Mission Care Collective to help the industry better understand people and what's happening in the space. So that's that's the why behind it. I'm a big believer in. Um, not just going to the industry and saying, hey, here's what we think, but what's the data actually um, telling us? And we operate the largest network of um, direct care workers in the nation. We can get a lot of statistically significant data very quickly. We service 8,000 healthcare providers across the nation. Again, we can get a lot of statistically significant information really quickly to bring to the industry. So um, we do a lot of research to basically surface the stories of what's happening in the market to try to accelerate change. So let's go over some of the findings uh, from the study. And I would say, I, I feel like I'm pretty informed about the industry. And yet there were a couple things in here. There were, there's a few things that maybe reinforced what my thoughts were and a couple that went in a little bit of a different direction. So let me start with the ones that uh, were a little bit surprising to me. So you, you went straight at this question of racial bias. And the uh, findings, if I understood it, were that something like over 80% of providers said that a portion of their clients have race-specific staffing requests. What is what is that all about? Yeah, so it's, it's really complex. So um, if you think about home care agencies for a moment, that's who this, this study was analyzing, home care providers. Um, they're tasked with uh, a family member, a client that needs care. And oftentimes you might have the adult daughter, a family member calling in, and it's their first experience with care. They don't really know. So a lot of times their experience, someone's experience with care is, I go to the hospital, I know what a doctor's like, I know what a nurse is like, I walk into a doctor's office, I know what that experience is like. But people don't really understand home care until they're thrust into that environment. So sometimes you have families that call into a home care agency and they think they're getting a doctor or a nurse that's going to be coming out to their house. And they start experiencing um, who a direct care worker is. And again, direct care workers are uh, primarily 63% uh, women of um, color. Uh, again, 53% of folks on public assistance. It's a much different profile than a doctor or a nurse or what someone was used to. And so it's not uncommon then for a family to call into a home care agency and say, I want someone that like looks like me. I mm -hmm. want someone, and, and it's, it's the reality of what happens. There's gender requests. You know, I want another female. I want a male. I want someone that looks like me. I want someone that has the same cultural behaviors as me. Because ultimately, like, being in the home is a very private thing, and what happens behind closed doors is a very private thing, and the families aren't educated. So it's not uncommon for then the family to request, because they don't know anything different, for a caregiver to uh, look like them, which adds some complexities to staffing because we're yeah. in shortage, right? And there's not enough people fundamentally to deliver the care. Caregivers can make more money someplace else. Gas is expensive. Caregivers don't travel very far. So you've got some logistical challenges. And then you have the complexity of a family not really knowing um, and, and making requests. Got it. So, all right. So we're going to come back to later, a little bit later, some of the policy recommendations here. So that one, I, I would say, I guess it surprised me. It also, maybe it more disturbed me than anything. The other one that really surprised me, and I'd like you to explain this a little bit more, is that a, a lot of uh, the agencies said that clients are reluctant to work with, with young caregivers. Is that the case? And, and why, why, is, why is that? And what, what is young? 
Yeah. Again, I think it goes back to people not knowing what to expect. Like when you go into a hospital or you go into a doctor's office, you're not used to seeing someone that's 18, 19, 20 years old caring for you. You're used to seeing somebody with a, a nursing degree, right, that's caring for you. So um, that's that's one side. The other side is, and this is kind of a sad reality of, of our industry, there are some companies that um, won't necessarily even introduce a caregiver to their client they'll get a brand new person in with little to no training because there are no federal regulations for the direct care workforce. They're thrust into the home of someone with little to no training or skills. You don't need a certification to go work in um, home care, for instance, and they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So then the family's like, well, I need someone that's older, assuming that someone that's older does know how to to do it. So again, I think it comes down to the education that's needed for families to look beyond skin color, to look beyond age and to more uh, look at the competencies. And that's that's a, a big part of what a home care agency, you know, needs needs to do with their clients. Got it. Okay. Well, I think I would separate out a little bit differently, maybe the racial one from the, the, the youth. And that sounds like that the youth one is sort of a proxy for uh, ex- experience and if there's if there's no training, then someone who's made it further along in life has probably learned how to do, you know, some of these things. I, I guess I can understand that one a little bit better um, of why someone might have that as a uh, as a reason. But it is certainly problematic if you're an agency that's already has a challenge to um, you know get staff, and then you have these further constraints, and there's probably nobody who can who can go and do it. Mm-hmm. So another one, and I guess now they build on these couple of ones that it was something like uh, close to 90% of agencies had, they had to turn away care, you know, due to limitations in the, in the workforce. And that's not shocking to me, I suppose. Um, you'll see a place like, uh, you know, a drugstore or, or other shop that just shuts down because they can't get people to come in. So I think this is probably similar, although it's pretty, it's pretty problematic for, uh, for patients. What about this, uh, the thought that, um, 76% said the industry hasn't fully recovered from COVID-19 pandemic. I guess one question is maybe when specifically was the question asked and, and what does that mean? Yeah, so this research, it was conducted about um, six months ago. And, and one thing that's just really interesting that happened with the, the pandemic from a workforce perspective is when everything Canada came roaring back, there was a point where it's like everything closed. And so yeah. it was good for home care because people were like, oh, home care was hiring, right? Like home yeah. care didn't close for business. So malls were closed, retail was closed, and people are like, oh, I'll check out this this industry that's, that's hiring. Well, when everything came roaring back, all of a sudden everything came roaring back at much higher salaries. And most home care companies are constrained by what they can pay based on the Medicare reimbursement rates, which haven't increased. So right. um, all of a sudden, workforce issues were compressed. You had schools, like the pipeline of CNAs and home health aides across the nation essentially stopped mm-hmm. because you had all the schools that stopped. You had states that stopped approving certifications. You So you stopped kind of new entrants, if you will, from, um, from coming in. Now compound this with opportunities like galore that can earn more money and like wages talk. I mean, for these, for these sure. folks that are looking to come, you know, up out of, out of poverty, if you will, and they can make more money than they've ever made before. So there was like a mass exodus and there still is quite frankly, David, of people that are um, leaving the industry and the other compounding factor. And I think, again, it's just lack of education is, um, during COVID, there were a lot of like financial stipends for the workforce, which is a great thing. It helped people pay their bills, help stabilize things. But um, what's fascinating, it actually just led 22 interviews with home health aides, and they don't understand like how wages work in the space. Like if yeah. you're an employee in a home care company, you think, oh, my my boss is making a lot of money because I'm only making X and they're, you know, getting Y. They don't understand reimbursement rates. And in this environment during COVID, there were extra stipends and they're thinking these are coming from like my company and my company can pay more. Well, now fast forward post COVID and other companies are paying more and the stipends have stopped. It's, it's tough. And, you know, five years ago from an agency perspective, I would say, an agency, if they were really good, could recruit their way out of a retention problem. Now they can't do that. Got the it. workforce issues are too bad. So you described, obviously, the constraints from a, a, a reimbursement standpoint. Uh, are you dealing also with caregivers that are working in a, in the self-pay side of things? I'm, I'm sure there's families that are paying for home care that are you know outside of 
uh, outside of the reimbursement. Yeah, absolutely. So we service from a provider perspective, both private pay and um, home health and nursing homes and, and senior living. But from a workforce perspective, a lot of times they might be working across the continuum. Like there's caregivers that might have a case in home health and they have a case in, in private pay. Got it. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of things that are that are happening here, a lot of findings that you're reinforcing or bringing forward for the first time or, or quantifying out of this survey. Do you follow through in terms of policy recommendations or, or what are the, what are some of the policy implications of what you're seeing in the industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have a, a few recommendations based on the, the data and findings. I think number one from a home health perspective is we need to stop the Medicare reimbursement rate cuts because at the end of the day, that's going to cut wages for workers. It's going to cut into small operating margins for many of these agencies. And quite frankly, I think put them out of the business. And especially if they're rural, it's going to cut access to care. So um, that's, you know, that's one area. Um, It's been good to see movement by CMS in terms of investing in the workforce, but we need to do it in a way that's not ultimately going to um, put home health agencies out of business and cut into the pockets of the direct care workforce. Um, I think we need to address head on the wage challenges, the fiscal cliff challenges. Um, that's very real. Um, fiscal cliff challenges are, are extra real in home care when you're not yeah. guaranteed hours. I mean, it's yeah. hard to lose your benefits if you don't, you can't get full time hours or you're going into a situation where your client might not be here in another few weeks. So I think we need to address that more supportive services like One thing that came out of the study, too, David, that you might find interesting is agencies are struggling with call offs by direct care workers because of transportation and child care issues. That makes sense when you look at the population living on the wages that they are. How can we address that through um, supportive services for people to to keep them in care? I think we need policy um, around that area. I think we need policy that's just as focused on. Um, the current workforce is we do bring more people into care. Like we tend to see more policy on how do we bring more people into the industry? And it's almost the forgotten population, if you will, of the people that are already here. How do we keep the experienced caregivers in care? The people that want to do this job, that have a calling to do this job, how can we kind of keep them whole? And then, you know, last but, but not least is I think we need to look at how can we expand scope of services for like what an aide can do? Can we reimagine what an aide can do? Like the work short nurses as well, but it takes a long time to create a nurse. Yeah. It takes a lot less time to create an aide. Like how can we think differently about pathway programs and expansion of services to start chipping away at some of these challenges? So some of the challenges that you're that you're describing, you know, are pretty pretty broad in terms of the policy implications. So when you talked about transportation, for example, I know in Boston where I live, the tea has been a mess, you know, and I never take the tea, but I don't have to take the tea. Um, but it really interferes with people's ability to get to a job if, you know, it's going to take them, if it's unpredictable, it's canceled or whatever, um, you know, that's a, that's a problem there. And then Although you're not talking, you're suggesting that we focus on those that are in the industry, at least, and in, you know, as, as a key part of this. There's also the question of of immigration, uh, mm-hmm. which has gone down, and uh, which you know sort of chokes off the supply for this industry, among others. Yeah, yeah, and I think you can leave no stone unturned. I think we need to solve this from a lot of different a lot of different angles. But I think the the piece from a policy perspective, where I think we definitely need more eyeballs is keeping people in the industry. Like the thing that keeps me up at night, again, we operate the largest network of caregivers in the nation. We've never seen more people leaving. There's not enough people coming in. And quite frankly, a lot of people that come in, this job isn't for everyone. We don't just want volume of workers. It's like you you need people that are good and have a heart to to care for people. And um, we, we definitely cannot lose the people that we have here because that problem is going to be compounded if people keep leaving. We talked before about this issue about the younger workers and uh, the family sometimes re- rejecting them. Largely, it sounds like because they're not they're not trained. Are there opportunities for more training, or are the economics of the industry such that that's that's difficult to actually achieve? And you're just going to throw end up having to throw people in, and they just got to get experience on the on the job. 
you know, I think it's really hard from a provider perspective. Like most providers, like internally, they are drinking from a fire hose yeah. all day, trying to like match caregivers to clients and they don't have enough people. And it's hard to train and invest in someone when the average industry turnover, David, is 77%. And so yeah. from a provider perspective, it's really challenging for them to, to train more. Should they? Of course. Is it easy? It's terribly challenging, actually. Um, but as an industry, absolutely, we can do a better job training people. Like we need federal credentials. Like it's wild. You can be a CNA in um, Florida by, you know, passing an exam. Uh, but that's different than what needs to happen if you want to be a CNA in Kentucky or Illinois. So um, I think we can absolutely do a better job from a training perspective. I think we need to up the standards, quite frankly. Yeah. If we want to professionalize the role, if there's an opportunity to expand scope of services, I think that's part of what we need to do. I don't think the role's been professionalized. I think there's, sometimes there's confusion between, am I a caregiver or am I a housekeeper? Yeah. There is no training and education that really goes along with it. So yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity for a federal and, and state initiatives to move the needle there. Yeah, and I'm not sure how much can be done on the on the demand side of the equation either. I mean, you, you mentioned we talked started off talking about you know the different preferences that uh, people have. I think this this question about you know, housekeeper versus caregiver is is definitely a source of of confusion uh, for you know those that are on the on the uh, the customer or patient side. Yeah, you know what's interesting? It's a lot of families won't think twice about paying a hundred dollars a day to have a housekeeper. Yeah. But they will think twice about paying that for a caregiver. Got it. I guess it just needs to be repositioned. Hey, come and take care of my appliances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we won't follow my 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 policy recommendations in that case. But in <laughs> we'll any, leave that one out, David. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> so, um, you know, I it sounds like I can and now I understand a little bit better the need for a kind of collective response here. Uh, these are big issues. Uh, I don't want to say intractable. Um, but ones that need a sort of a sustained and, and collective approach to it. So I'm going to turn away uh, from that uh, and uh, and close here by asking you if there's any uh, good book that you've read lately, anything that you would recommend for our audience. Can I share two? Yeah. I'd, I sometimes <laughs> offer more than one, but I don't want someone to feel badly. But yes. Okay. Two books. So yes. Uh, one, I'm on my second iteration of the Bible, and it is wild what I missed on the first round. So I highly recommend reading Life's Manual more than once. The other book that's on my nightstand is a book called Traction. Have you heard of that, David? No, I have not heard of that, no. Okay. So we have a, a, a great new COO. He just joined the team. He's a pure gift, and he's helping our company adopt the EOS operating model as we scale. So on my nightstand is the Bible and traction. So um, all things Bible and EOS are my world right now. Well, that sounds pretty comprehensive. So uh, I appreciate that one. I have had uh, you know lots of uh, CEOs, and I, I haven't had actually either one of those uh, books recommended uh, explicitly, although there have been some biblical references uh, in the interviews. Great. Well, Brandy Kritika from Mission Care Collective, I want to say thank you so much for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks, David. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.